This is the 2023 Chevrolet Corvette C8 Stingray, the quintessential American sports car. It's proudly flown the flag for the US since 1953 across eight generations, and in that time, it's touched millions of hearts, including mine. As a kid, the VET was always on my bedroom wall. C1, C2, C3, C4, the lot. This car has always been one of my favorites, not because it's the best, but because it was cheap, fast, and it looked good. I could never see a world in which I'd end up driving a Lamborghini or a Ferrari or an Aston Martin, but a Chevy Corvette, if I worked hard enough, maybe. Unfortunately, over the years, I kind of fell out with the VET because it was never really sold in the UK officially as a right-hand drive car. They've only started to do that very recently. It was frustrating. So rather than hanging around waiting for Chevy to bring a VET to the UK to me, I thought I'd bring me to a VET in the USA. Rekindle the old flame. This C8 is the eighth generation of the Corvette, launched in the car's 70th year on sale. It uses a 6.2 litre V8 that makes 492 horsepower, manages 0 to 60 in 2.9, and can do 195 miles an hour flat out. Which is astonishing, especially as this car costs $64,000. It's the same price as a BMW 3 Series. Right, gonna open it up for the first time, second gear. Oh yes. Oh yes. Honest first impressions. I'm thinking, how can they make a car look this good with this much power for that much money? God bless America. And speaking of impressive bang for your buck, since we're in America with a quintessentially American sports car sampling some local delights, I thought I'd make a slight detour and pull into a local hobby shop to have a go at America's favorite national pastime. No, not overconsumption and extreme capitalism. Shooting at things for no real reason at all. You know, when in Rome and all that. How very uncouth, you might say, which is fair enough, because that's one of the criticisms you could level at the Corvette. In comparison to its European rivals, it's often been considered to be a bit less sophisticated, loud, brash, and slightly unrefined. But look closely, and you might see that that's not actually the case. It's a very powerful car, but it's also a very usable car. This one is a Roadster, so it's got the metallic hardtop. I'm going to leave that on today because it is exceptionally hot outside. It has an aluminium chassis, which means the whole thing is incredibly stiff. All of it feels really tightly glued together. No squeaks, no rattles. Feels really premium in that sense. There is a little bit of road noise, which is slightly annoying, especially at motorway speeds, but the suspension is really nice in this car. It's got double wishbones front and rear, plus optional magneto rheological dampers, which means you can stiffen it up or slacken it off depending on what you want on any particular drive. It's even got a fancy nose lift system, which raises the nose by 40 millimeters to allow you to access driveways and curbs. And the impressive thing is, you don't have to press it every single time you get to that specific place because it remembers up to 40 locations. Whenever you get to your favorite spot that needs the car raised, it will do it for you. But speaking of favorite spots, so, as exotic as it might look, the C8 is a really good daily. One you don't have to think twice about pulling out on a random Sunday afternoon to do regular things. It's a car you can be spontaneous with. It's a car that's not just for the super rich. This is a sports car for regular people who want to use it daily to do regular things. The interior helps with that too, with, you guessed it, cup holders big enough for oversized American style fizzy drinks, a good sized glove box, and all the technology you could wish for, including a very solid infotainment system with cameras that help you park and internet connectivity. It will even let you listen to TikTok radio for goodness sake. The screen does look a little haphazardly placed and the control buttons, as they say in America, are a hot mess, but the Corvette has two boots, one at the rear and another at the front, offering decent combined storage for all your precious cargo. 
Okay, pop quiz, hot shot. I saw that in an American movie once. If you know, you know, very apt for this car. Pop quiz, name me another car for 50,000 pounds that looks as mad as this thing. You can't do it, can you? In fact, I'll wait, load up a tab, go to Auto Trader, set a filter for 50 grand and find me a car that looks as mad as this. You can't do it. Not mad in a good way. Everything about the car is just sharp. You got a really sharp bonnet, a sharp bumper, a sharp front end, sharp headlights. And if we go around the side, even the wheels are sharp. They're offset, 19s at the front, uh, 245s and 305s at the rear, 20 inches. There's a little bit too much arch gap for my liking. I'd like to see 20s at the front and 21s at the rear. But if you go around to the back, the sharpness continues. Look at the size of this rear wing. It's enormous, plus these end plates. They almost look like weapons. And then you've got these amazing looking light clusters, which look like they come straight out of an anime movie. Real vents, big old diffuser down the bottom, quad exhaust pipes. The whole thing is just antisocial looking, but then it's a Corvette. What do we expect? I'll tell you what we didn't expect, come round the side, because this bit here, what you're looking at, is an air intake. And that means, unlike previous Corvettes, the C8 is mid-engine. And that, it's fair to say, isn't very American at all. So is the Corvette losing its US identity somewhat? Well, perhaps, but the mid-engine layout does come with its advantages, notably traction. Okay, so check this out. There was a version of the C7, the previous generation Corvette called the ZR1, which made a massive 755 horsepower, way more than this car, around 260 more. That did 0 to 60 in three seconds dead. This car will do 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds, even quicker than the ZR1 with skinnier tires and less power. And a lot of that is down to the fact that it's got this really weird weight distribution owing to the mid-engine layout. It has 60% of its weight over the back wheels and 40 over the front, which means it just squats down. And when you hit the accelerator, it just takes off. It just goes to show, big dumb power isn't always the way to go, America. All right, it is quite a lot of the time, but not always. That mid-engine layout really does transform the way the Corvette drives. You sit in the center of the vehicle and it feels almost like the thing is pivoting around that central point. Imagine using a hula hoop and just controlling the car with your hips. That's exactly how it feels when you pile it into a corner. It just rotates so sweetly. It's not a hardcore car by any stretch of the imagination. There's actually a fair amount of body roll, even in the most aggressive suspension setting. But it's not alarming. What it does is it just leans on the outside wheel, loads up the contact patch, and almost catapults you to the opposite side of the bend. And then get on the power, and you're good to do it all over again. God, the traction is just there in spades. But that's not to say it's not a playful car, it really is. A lot of mid-engine cars tend to really hold the road nicely until things get a little bit hairy and then they let go completely and snap on you. But this, this is almost telepathic. It lets you know exactly when you're gonna run out of traction. And that builds so much confidence and lets you push and push and push. And when you do wanna have a little bit of fun, no problem. The beauty of the Corvette is you can choose how you drive it. In tour mode, the suspension is soft and easy to live with. It's firmer in sports and even more so in track, but the ideal mode is the customizable Z mode, which lets you tailor the drive parameters to your specific taste. One of the settings you're gonna wanna play with is the steering because in tour mode, it's so light. It's, it's too light, it's almost like driving a runaway shopping trolley almost. But then in track mode, it's too hard. You're probably gonna wanna leave it directly in the center. And when you do, the car feels really, really direct. I'd like it if the steering was a little bit quicker and just reacted a little bit more urgently to my inputs and was a bit more direct. It does have a little bit of understeer in it, particularly on these downhill sections, but you drive around it, honestly. We talk about cars with flow. This thing just flows beautifully through these canyon roads. The brakes, 
good and strong. Not carbon ceramics, don't need them though. Steels are good enough for this application. Gearbox, seven speed PDK, works really well. I do have one gripe with it though. It doesn't snap when you upshift. In some cars you feel that big punch of torque whenever you change up, but in this it's buttery smooth and that kind of robs a little bit of involvement for me. Also, these paddles are a little bit on the smooth side. I want a little bit of a click, almost like you're pulling a, a trigger. This is America, after all. As for weight, it's heavy, 1,645 kilograms. Porsche 911 is 1,500 kilograms. A Lotus Emira is 1,400, and an Alpine A110 is 1,100 kilograms. So, yeah. It's a heavy old car, but you don't really feel it. Honestly, the weight is, it's just the number. Here's the kicker. I think the Chevy Corvette is better than most of its rivals. It's more powerful than a basic Carrera 2 911. It's more playful than an Alpine A110, and it's more controllable on the limit than a Lotus Amira. And pound for pound, it's cheaper than all of them. This is the sports car to have not just a good American sports car, it's a genuinely world-class sports car that really does hold its own on the global stage.